There is an anointing within, 1 John 2, 27, that protects us from deception. Nothing to do with the anointing on a ministry or an office. Nothing to do with the gifts of the Spirit. Because this anointing deals with the Spirit. While the anointing of, what, of Acts 1-8 deals with the soul and the body. The anointing that was promised in Acts 1-8 affects the soul and the body, not, not the Spirit. Because ye shall receive power, Acts 1-8, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be witnesses unto me in, in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, and the world. That anointing is for ministry. But the anointing that I'm talking about is for protection from the demonic. That anointing, when it comes in you, not on you, say in me, in not, me. On me. not on me. Say the one in me, one in me. is for me. Is for me. The, one me the one on me is for somebody else. Look to our precious Jesus today who saves, heals, delivers, prospers, and blesses. This is your day for a miracle. Casting all your cares upon him, the scripture says. He cares for you. Oh, how he cares. So much he cares. Cares about every problem, every situation in your life. Trust him now. Trust the one who will never disappoint you. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Give him that problem, whatever it is, give it to him. Yes, he's able. He's able to do exceeding abundantly of all you ask or ever can think. Trust him. He'll not fail you, I promise you. He'll never turn away from you, I promise you. He said, I shall never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's his word, his promise. Be at peace, all is well. All is well. He will not let you down. He will never fail you. He will never disappoint you. Never. Trust Him. Trust Him. Have faith in God. Don't waver, don't weekend trust him and that problem in your life will be solved on schedule that problem will be taken care of on schedule lift your hands and thank him he will not be late it will be right on schedule that's his word all of you watching me in your homes, Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, all social media platforms. He'll never fail us. He'll never fail you. How many are sensing the presence of the Lord here? Uh, he's among us, saints. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. I shall never leave thee. I shall never forsake thee. I am with you always. That's his promise. You're never alone. Not for a second. Someone reverently say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now you may be seated. We serve a wonderful and a mighty Lord. And the people said, Amen. Well, I'm going to minister the word right now. So take your Bibles. Let's get in the word. We serve a mighty Redeemer, and his name is Jesus. Jesus. Sweet, sweet Jesus. Don't forget to join uh,
partner can act. Oh, dear goodness, I'm having a great time with that. And you know what? The material I'm sharing, I don't share anywhere else. So you really need to be on to see what I'm talking about. I think you've been watching. It's true training in ministry. It's not anything I have taught ever in this class or will ever teach in this class or in any in, in, in crusade. This is a just training for ministry like raw and you will be blessed i promise you all right tonight i want to minister on something that i think is so important in this hour recognizing demonic activity and casting it out of your life and casting it out from anyone near your life let me hear an amen, amen. now this is important because it's happening so much around us and bless the Lord, anoint us today. Be our teacher, Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and understanding. Give us clarity in Jesus' mighty name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm hearing some disturbing reports. And I felt it's time for me to address it. Do you believe that pastors have gotten up recently in their churches names, uh, well-known names, and told their pastors not to talk about the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Fact. This is not say so either. The staff of those churches, some of them left over it. Famous names met privately with their staff and told them not to ever talk about the Holy Spirit because they don't want to lose members. They don't want to offend people. I don't know what planet they're living on. Without the Holy Spirit, we have no faith. Without the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to believe. You cannot even say Jesus is Lord without him behind it. We're not talking about miracles and gifts. We're talking about the Christian life cannot be lived without the Holy Spirit. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Everything God does, he does by the Holy Spirit. And today what we're lacking is the discerning of spirits. What spirit is talking? So when someone gets up and says, don't talk about the Holy Spirit, you know who's behind that. All right. The first chapters of the Bible show us how important. How important it, it's, it's that we recognize who's talking to us. Because what Eve lacked was she did not discern the true identity of the devil. She did not know who was talking to her. And because she failed to discern his true identity, a failure resulted and the fall was the result that now affect the whole planet. Think about the importance of the gift of discernment. She did not discern the lie. Did not know the truth. So right there in the beginning of Genesis, we see the danger. When people lack discernment. That's why we are commanded in Scripture, in 1 John 4. Would you put that on the screens for the people? 1 John 4, verse 1, and 1 John 4, verse 2. I want that on the Scriptures for the people. The Bible tells us this. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many, not just some, not just few, many false prophets are gone into the world. And dear goodness, they're all over the place in this hour. Not only back 2,000 years ago. 
The next verse says, verse 2, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. What he's telling us is that we must know the Spirit of God when he is speaking. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Because at the time, there was a heresy going around, taught and was teaching the opposite. And other doctrines were running around in those days that brought confusion. There is an anointing within, 1 John 2, 27, that protects us from deception. Nothing to do with the anointing on a ministry or an office. Nothing to do with the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 John John the Apostle talks about this amazing anointing that comes in at the time you and I are born again. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and it's no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now this anointing is totally different than the anointing of Acts 1.8. Because this anointing deals with the spirit. While the anointing of, what, of Acts 1.8 deals with the soul and the body. The anointing that was promised in Acts 1.8 affects the soul and the body, not, not the spirit. Because ye shall receive power, Acts 1.8, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, to be witnesses unto me in, in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, and the world. That anointing is for ministry. But the anointing that I'm talking about is for protection from the demonic. That anointing, when it comes in you, not on you, Say, in me, in not, me. On me. not on me. Say, the one in me, one in me. Is, for me. is for me. The one on me one is for somebody else. Somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. God anoints you on you so you can minister to someone else, be witnesses uh, to Jerusalem and so forth, and Judea and Samaria. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, not in you. Upon you means on you. And then you are witnessing. You are blessing other people's lives. You're touching people's lives. This is for your life. The first John 2, 27, anointing is for your life. Now, the Word of God says that when that, uh, that anointing is within, we cannot be deceived. Amen. It says there's no lie in it. It's the truth. It keeps you grounded in truth. So, when we know the Holy Spirit, only then we can know what Spirit is talking. Eve did not know the Holy Spirit. That's why she had no clue who was talking to her. Because the devil always comes with a question. Hath God said, are you really sure he said that to you? Remember when he came to the Lord, he said, are you the Son of God? If you are, let's see. Always questions. If you are the Son of God, come on, turn this stone into bread. Questions, questions, questions. But we answer with the Word by the Spirit. The Word I speak, it's Spirit, Jesus said. Now, trying the spirits or discerning the spirits is a gift. Imparted by the Spirit. It's not something you and I can produce mentally. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10, may I see it on the screen, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. It's the, the discerning of spirits, uh, plural spirits, uh, three realms. To another, 
the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits, meaning there's more than one realm. So God wants us all to have this gift of discerning spirits because there are three realms. Now, the Bible tells us what these realms are. But let me also explain, it's the ability to see into the spirit world. The spirit world where God is. That's in 2 Kings 6, by the way, 15 through 17. Elisha discerned the spirit of God behind a vision. And we can look at that now, 2 Kings 6. 2 Kings 6, 15, 16, 17, we, we see the discerning of spirits revealing the Holy Ghost behind it. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, gone forth, behold, the host compassed the city, both with horses, chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? This, this dear man did not have the, the gift of discernment. Next verse, please. He answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. The servant saw the flesh. Elisha saw the spirit. And then it says what? The next verse. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see what I'm seeing that he may see, and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. Elisha did not have, listen now, Elisha did not have to, he saw it himself. He didn't have to ask the question, please let me see it. He didn't question it himself. It's the young man who said, look at all those chariots and horses of the armies of Syria. Fear struck his life. But Elisha saw beyond that. Now, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see what I'm seeing. And those horses, chariots and horses of fire became visible to the young man. But they were already visible to Elisha in the spirit realm. Elisha didn't have to see that with his physical eyes. Are you listening? Yes. He saw in the spirit behind those horses the, the, the armies of God. All that man saw was the horses in the flesh, the army in the flesh. Elisha saw the, the higher plateau, the greater. And then he said, Lord, open his eyes. Let, let, let the man see what I'm saying. Here is a very simple example of the gift of discernment. Into the spirit world, the spirit world of God here. But there's also where in Acts 16, verse 16 through verse 19, where a spirit came after Paul the apostle, and what the spirit said was truth. But he discerned it wasn't the Holy Ghost speaking. So Paul saw the demonic when that spirit was actually speaking truth. Demons sometimes will tell you the truth. But they're, it's, it's, it's a deceiving spirit. There's a lie there. It came to pass as we went to pray at a certain damsel, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Keep next verse, please. The same father Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God. That's the truth, all right. Which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, there was no lie in what she said. But Paul the apostle discerned, it's the devil talking. Next verse. And did... And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour because he saw the satanic. So just because someone speaks the truth, it doesn't mean it's the Holy Ghost. You have to discern who's really talking. Because often the truth comes to trick you, to deceive you, to bring you into a place of darkness. 
So be careful. It's not what you hear uh, that matters. It's what you see that matters in the spirit. Who's talking back there? And there is another spirit that often people don't discern properly. And that's the human realm, the human spirit. Isaac missed it. Look at Genesis 27, verse 22. Well, let's begin reading at verse 21. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice of Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not. There he missed it. A man of God can miss it sometimes. We all need the Holy Spirit to give us the true discerning and discernment of who is it that's talking to us. He said, I, the voice is Jacob. But he missed it. Even the voice did not do the job. But the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not because his hands were hairy and his brother's Esau's, like his brother's Esau's. Now here, you see Eve not discerning, it was the devil talking. Now you have Elisha telling the Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Discerning the Holy Ghost. Paul discerned the wrong spirit in that lady who spoke truth. Three realms. You can discern when God is speaking. You can discern when the enemy is speaking. You can discern when the world is speaking. Only by the Spirit. I want to deal with something that I have seen over and over lately, and I'm seeing more of it, and it's troubling me. And I am asking God again to take the scales off not only my eyes, but your eyes. You say, what are you talking about? Back in OCC and when the Crusades began, the anointing of God was so mighty on me that I was able to tell if sickness was satanic or not. Because sometimes we pray for the sick and we pray wrong. We say heal them rather than come out of them. And the Lord is telling me that anointing is coming again on me. To take, because see, it's seasonal. Sometimes God will not show you. It doesn't always happen. Oh, thank God, we're coming into a new season of unbelievable power. And, and you're going to see now, if you're ready for this, the Bible says this. The Lord discerned in Luke 13, 11, the spirit of infirmity upon a woman. Behold, there was a woman which had the spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together. Now, some would call that arthritis. Some would call it a bone disease. Some would not see the spirit behind it. This woman was hunched over, could not lift herself up. The world would say she needs physical help. But the Lord saw the demon behind it that kept her bent over. The spirit of infirmity was upon that lady for 18 years and kept her body bound like this and where she could not straight, straighten up. And the Lord healed her and the spirit of infirmity left her. In Mark 9, 25, watch this. This is quite something. Oh, this is quite something. 
you're going to learn some good things right now. Because only the Holy Spirit can reveal such things. Because with your eyes, you cannot really tell. You're thinking it's one thing when it's another. Because your eyes will deceive you. Mark 9. Jesus came down from the mountain of glory. His disciples tried to cast out a demon. They couldn't do it. They brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straight away the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. Now here, this little boy, young boy, the spirit was tearing him. He was foaming at the mouth. But look what Jesus called that spirit in verse 25. This is powerful. When Jesus saw that the people came running, he rebuked the foul spirit saying, you dumb and deaf. Stop it. How did he know? The boy was not deaf or dumb that you can tell. He wasn't talking or hearing. That, that boy was throwing up, foaming at the mouth. But that spirit, which people would call a different name, Jesus called deaf and dumb. This demon spirit comes on him, throwing him at the fire, wanting to kill him. But here a spirit that was manifesting murder was called deaf and dumb. Today, some churches would send that poor boy to a doctor and give him a pill, put him on some antidepressants. Jesus cast that demon out and called it, it by name. That's one of the strong men. I need to teach on that again. The 12 strong men who control all demonic activity. One of them is the deaf and dumb spirit. And when you come against that, you literally, <laughs> every demon under that strong man reacts. This is powerful because a deaf and dumb spirit produces foaming at the mouth. Produces exactly what you see in this verse. It says the spirit, the scripture says, they brought to him the, that boy and the spirit began to tear him. He fell on the ground foaming. He began to scream because of pain in his body. He began to form at the mouth, and I've seen that many times. That spirit wanted to kill him. But Jesus called that demon deaf and dumb, because that's the strong man's name behind that spirit. And, 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 that young boy was being attacked by a demon of suicide. Yet the demon of suicide was controlled by the deaf and dumb spirit. That's the strong man. Matthew 12, 22. Here's another one. This is uh, quite remarkable. Matthew 12, 22. Look what it says. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil blind and dumb and he healed him in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw and all the people were amazed and said is not this the son of David now he commanded the demon behind the blindness that was causing the blindness that was causing that boy not to be able to speak. He healed him that he began to speak and began to see, which means behind that blindness was a demon. So rather than saying, put your hands on your eyes, sometimes you say, you devil of blindness, come out. Well, somebody says, well, I'm struggling with this. Don't listen to what they say. Listen to what the Holy Ghost says is behind it. 
Sometimes you attack the wrong devil and you have no reaction. You hear this? Are you listening? You have no reaction because you're not coming against a strong man, which means you need to fast and pray. The Lord will show you what strong man is behind that thing. You can cast that out. And then that demon comes out and a whole lot of devils come out with him. Then you have Luke 8, 29, a spirit, a, a strong man called insanity. He had commanded the unclean spirit to come out, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven by the devil into the wilderness. Here you got that demoniac, yet behind that was the demon of insanity. Now, only the Holy Ghost can reveal that to you. Now, every believer who knows who he is, who she is, and walks and lives in the Spirit will understand because our battle is not with flesh and blood. Amen. Ephesians 6, 12, it's against principalities and powers and rulers. And you all know, of course, what it says in Ephesians 6. Five divisions of the devil's army are, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that means demons, but against pr principalities, that's chief rulers, against powers, sergeants that operate under the rulers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, which are men who are possessed by demons, and against spiritual weakness in high places. These are the five divisions of the devil's army right here. There are five divisions of angels and five divisions of the demonic also, because Satan copies God. So we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, meaning we are fighting demons, spirits. We're fighting principalities, chief rulers of the highest rank. We're fighting against powers, the sergeants that operate under the chief rulers. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world, meaning men, because of this world. It says this world, meaning in the individuals in, in authority, whether they be in government or other places who are demonic, who are possessed by demons. Like Herod was one of them, okay? Or Hitler is another one. And the fifth is spiritual weakness in high places. And these, ladies and gentlemen, are very powerful, evil angels controlling the affairs of men who work under, under the sergeants. You have to understand that the, that the realm of the demonic is highly organized. You have princes who are over nations. First, we wrestle against flesh, not flesh and blood, meaning spirits, meaning demons. So he hits first on who you fight when you wake up, demons. Principalities are those princes, chief rulers of the highest rank, like the prince of Persia, the prince of Grisha, the Bible calls them. These are, these are princes that literally control nations. Under them are those sergeants that control cities or, or, or chunks of nations. These principalities are very powerful. And, and it depends on where you go. I don't want to mess you up. No, I, because see, this is important that you understand that. Never run into a battle naked. You better be armed. Some people walk into places that God never called them to walk in and end up being destroyed because they walked in without proper weapons, came against a prince without the right weapons. Comprende? Now, the Bible has a lot to say about this. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 6 says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds all by the Holy Spirit. And you cannot fight the war in the flesh. And I want to talk about that next time because I really believe the Lord's going to really open your eyes and take the scales off. No, no, let me hear a big amen. amen. 
We have amazing power in the Spirit. It's more than prayer. It's prayer in the Spirit that brings victory. It's when the Holy Ghost takes over that brings victory. There is mighty power in the power of the blood by the Spirit. Mighty power in Jesus' name by the Spirit. It's not when you say in Jesus' name. It's when He says in Jesus' name. And how to yield to that is the key to victory. You cannot begin to operate in this gift of discernment unless you develop through exorcisa the knowledge of God's Word. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, just quickly on the screen, Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. We have to develop this gift of discernment when we exorcise the word. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you've, you have need that one teach you, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Next verse, please. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Next verse 14, please. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses, spiritual senses, exercised to discern good and evil. So the word of God is the power that gives you discernment. And the Bible tells us, that we develop that, Ezekiel 44, 23, on the screen, please. Ezekiel 44, 23, quickly. We develop that as we receive the knowledge of God's Word by the Spirit of the Lord. They shall teach my people the difference between holy and profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and clean. That is by the Holy Spirit men and women are able to teach. And the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1, verse 3 and 4, that God gives us that. It's not given by our ability. According as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through what? The knowledge of Him, that's His Word, has called us to glory and virtue. It's the Word of God that gives you all power where you can begin to receive all power for life and godliness, yeah, yeah. including discernment. Now, say after me this. Say, prayer is the bridge, is the bridge. that moves me that moves. from the natural, from the natural. To, the to the spiritual. So, prayer is a bridge, but the word is the power when you pass the bridge. You have to have prayer to move from one world to the next. Because prayer moves you over. That's what it says in Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call unto me. And I will show thee. You're going to move ahead. You're going to move somewhere else. Call unto me and I will show thee. I will reveal to you what you cannot see and you cannot do. Great and mighty things, great and mighty things that thou knowest not. That's a bridge moving you from one world to the next. Now, here are things you ought to look for in people. And if you see those things... Pull them out back. Bring them back to where they belong in Christ. Write this down. Take a pen and paper. This is very, very important because I told you earlier how to recognize and then how to cast it out. What are the things we look for in people's lives or maybe your own life? What are the, the things that bring danger to you? Losing discernment is a very serious matter. But when people lose discernment, things will manifest. And here they are, number one. They begin to regress spiritually. The minute discernment is gone, they regress, meaning they begin to withdraw. They withdraw spiritually. You see the lack of hunger in them become reality. They cease to hunger. They regress. They go backwards in the spirit. They are no longer reading the word. They no longer pray as often. 
They no longer watch Christian programming as often. They no longer read Christian books as often. Now they're reading magazines about gossip. Or watching dirt on TV that they had not watched before. They regress. That is the first sign of the lack of discernment. When the Holy Ghost starts to, when you begin to neglect prayer and the word. Remember what I, I just said. Prayer is the bridge and the word is power. To give you power to live in that second realm, in that realm of the spirit. But there's, when there's no prayer and no word, people begin to regress. And regress means they withdraw, they pull away from the spiritual. Number two, from regression, they go into suppression. Suppression means they conceal joy. They conceal. Now you begin to see a, a lack of joy. People unable to express feelings. They begin to conceal the things of God. They begin to hide the Christian life and they suppress it. And now there's lack of joy and lack of power. Regression leads to suppression. They suppress it. They can seal it. This is, this is why I tell you the danger is here. When preachers get up and tell their people, don't talk about the Holy Ghost. Hide it. Conceal it. Don't talk about it. Frankly, the devil is behind that. Now, when they regress and they suppress, then they move into depression. Depression is a lack of strength in people's lives. Unable to win, unable to break through their situation. Their spirit is broken now. Their spirit is crushed. That's called depression. When people are depressed, they have no strength to fight. When they go into depression, they move into the, the fourth. If, if, if someone doesn't help them and stop them. They go from depression to oppression. And oppression is the, where they're unable to cope, unable to take care of the simplest situations. They become loaded down, unable to move. And now demons get in there. Oppression is where demons join themselves to the soul. They regress. They suppress, they depress, and demons are still not exactly connected. But the minute they are oppressed, demons get in there, and now a stronghold builds. And now there's no victory. And that's when the danger sets in. And I'm telling you something. That all begins with very simple stuff. When, when people just stop praying, stop reading the word, stop looking at Jesus, they start to regress. Then they start to conceal, suppress it. Then depression sets in and there's no, no strength to fight, but there's still hope now to get them out of there. Get them, take them by the throat and shake them up if you have to. Wake up! If you have to do it with your family, you do it. Take him by the shoulder. Come on, man, wake up. What, what are you doing to yourself? Because the second oppression sets in, you're fighting, a de you're fighting now a demon. You, you need bigger weapons for that one. Because now there's no victory. And number five, they go from oppression to obsession. Obsession is when uh, they become preoccupied with an idea or an emotion that cannot be broken. They begin to, to believe a lie and they live without reality. They lack reality. Oh, I know people like that. They lack reality. And six, if they do not, if someone doesn't help them out of their obsession, then it's possession. And that's the sixth step. People are now, they come under the, the control of a foreign invisible force. And possession happens 
when they are uh, when they fail to resist the devil and now that's where you need second corinthians 10 4 the weapons of our warfare are not carnal they are mighty through the pulling down of strongholds it's when people need to move in with that kind of power on their life and anointing that's why I'm telling you today we need discernment because you need to discern what's going on with people's lives even in your family and come against it and this is where prayer becomes the most powerful weapon in your life to bring deliverance to those who are captives and I believe there's three things that you can use to bring deliverance to the captives number one prayer number two praise and number three confession because prayer is the weapon that fuels the word it energizes the word prayer Holy Ghost let prayer will fuel up the word of God in you and then praise erupts praise is a mighty weapon I've seen people set free when, when, when others surround them and start praising. Demons begin to tremble and the demonic begins to vanish. So rather than saying, you come out, sometimes you have to stand there and praise. Let music do, do the job before you set in and say, in Jesus' name, get out of here. Jehoshaphat, remember, praise the Lord and demons turn against each other. And when you praise, demons fight each other in that, in, in, in that person. My God, there's power and praise. Because you bring God on the scene. That's why. You bring God on the scene. So I'm telling you, we are about to see powerful things come out of your life. I said powerful things are coming out of your life, people. The Lord's going to use you. Get ready. Say, I'm ready for use. Say it again. Louder, you and your homes too. Come on. I'm ready for and confession. What I mean by confession is what? And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. When you begin to apply the blood and begin to confess the power of God and confess what the word of God says, the promises of God, demons leave in fear and trembling. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power with your confession. These are the mighty weapons of war. Look what Psalm 17 verse 4 says as I'm done. Oh, I, th th this verse I've experienced. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, Lord, I have kept myself from the path of the destroyer. Wow. Wow. By the word of your lips, I have kept my life safe from the devil. By repeating your word, Lord, I've kept my life safe from the enemy. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and come. Come on, come on. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. I'm going to show you something quite powerful. I'm going to show you something quite powerful. All right. I want you all to turn to Psalm 23. You're going to read it out loud against the devil right now. You, 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 you're going to confess the word for you. Are you ready? You know, one of the most powerful things you can do is put your name with the promises of God. I said, put your name with the promises of God. When you read a promise, put your name in it and speak it out and watch what God will do with you and your family. Hallelujah. hallelujah I said hallelujah, hallelujah. lift your hands say I am, I am a mighty conqueror, mighty conqueror. No, weapon no weapon formed against me against will, me. Prosper. will prosper and every tongue and that rises against, against me I will condemn it is my inheritance it is my heritage servant of the Lord. I am the servant of the Most High God. And what 
I say will happen. The Lord is my shepherd. Come on, read it. I shall not want. Next verse, come on. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still one. Next verse. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Next verse, come on. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they cover me. Quickly, next verse, please. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Next verse, quickly. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. It's not by might or power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, and to Jesus be all the praise. Miracles are about to begin in a big way in your life. Get ready. I'm telling you, this is a season of turning around. God's power is about to be released on you in a mighty and glorious way, like a mighty wave of glory and power. And I want to pray and believe God with you right now that this will happen and bring miracles physically to you. Miracles spiritually to you, miracles emotionally, and miracles financially, because that's what God promised in His blessed word. Father, we come into agreement now for the mighty and glorious power of the Holy Spirit will come as a wave on our lives, bringing miracles spiritually, miracles emotionally, miracles physically and miracles financially in the life of every person watching this program today, in the life of every partner watching this program today. In the name of Jesus, we seal it, we decree it, we agree in the name of Jesus, done. And God's people said, amen and amen.